They started here, branched into these, branched into those, branched and so forth. It looks like a pedigree upside down. So that these things up here, these populations descended from here, but so did that one descend from there. Now the picture we're going to use is a little bit different, a little smoother. It's this one. This picture actually comes from a book by Stephen Jay Gould. I gave a talk on a slightly related subject and we use this picture a lot. We won't go into those ideas. But this is Stephen Jay Gould's picture of the tree of life. Not to be confused with the thing in the middle of the Garden of Eden with stuff on it. I, you know, it's a different subject, I think. Um, so a tree of life is sort of like an upside down pedigree. Some sort of trunk exists of some living things that started to differentiate. They started to change. This population became different from that population. They, they sort of both diverged into different directions. And that happened again here. It happened there. It happened there. It happened there, etc. This I like this tree because it shows something that is frightfully frequent in the history of life, which is extinction. So there's vast areas of well, we don't really know yet whether they're unexplored areas of space. We're going to have a reading group someday where we can all bicker about that. But what everyone agrees on is that some of these beautiful branches of life came to abrupt sometimes and probably destructive ends. All right, so the tree of life is not some bush that increases off into infinity. It's just a story of history. Right there, let's say right there is a species alive today. And it traces its ancestry back down here all the way to there. And here is another species that traces its ancestry back to there. And this one and that one have a common ancestor right there. Right? It's pretty straightforward. There's continuity throughout the tree. We don't have something right out there that we think came from another planet on a spaceship. At least, I don't think we have any of those. No one has documented them yet. Everybody's sort of attached to everybody else. So that's one of the lessons of the tree of life. <clears throat> so branches are related through common ancestry. There's biological continuity. I just said that. The units, these little things that are on the tree, those are not individual organisms. Those are populations. You might think I meant to say species. I actually don't care whether they're species or genuses. I think genera is the right word there. Phyla. I don't really care about that. The point is that this population and this one somehow became different and now we consider them separately. And then finally you may have heard all sorts of disturbing reports of gene transfer among organisms at the trunk of the tree of life thereby undermining the entire evolutionary paradigm. Well the second part's a joke but the first part is true. Down here at the trunk, so who knows where we are, are we back in the Cambrian, Precambrian, wherever, uh, there's all sorts of interesting stuff going on there, organisms swapping genes shamelessly, and, and you know, so that means maybe the trunk, well, these things happen, it's biology, sorry guys if you came here unprepared for that, um, <laughs> but um, the trunk is probably a little bit messy, so we don't mean to say, when we point at this tree, that all the way down here at the beginning is that one, that one ancestral cell that sort of went and then started making more and then next thing you know, three point some odd billion years later, here we are. Um, we don't think quite that simplistically about the trunk. I'll just say this, it doesn't matter to us what's going on down here. What matters is, frankly, what's going on here. This species being related to that one, being related to that one, all three with a common ancestor right there and there and there and there and there and there. And there. Okay, so just again to remind you how, say, natural selection or genetic change drives this process, not the topic tonight. I'll, we can take questions later about that if you'd like. And so then let's talk about what is the evidence that is explained by this tree. Henceforth today I'm going to say common ancestry. That's the theme tonight. If I accidentally lapse into using the word evolution, just replace that with common ancestry. That's what I'm talking about. I'm going to talk about four sort of big areas of evidence that are given explanation, made sense of, by common ancestry. We're going to start where you might think we would start, and that's with the fossil record. There's at least one expert on the fossil record in the crowd, so if you see me sort of glance nervously in some direction, it's not because I'm afraid that there's an administrator here who's going to fire me, it's because there's an expert here who might be laughing at the things I just said. Therefore, I'll be vague, at least partly because...
No, I'm not a lawyer, and I really don't have one. That wasn't that wasn't what that joke was about. But anyway, um, I'll, I'm going to be simple because there's a simple point to be made about the fossil record here, and the next point about transitional fossils a little bit more interesting. I'll know a little bit more about that. You've surely seen pictures like this before. Sometimes they have a lot more detail on them. Sometimes they're labeled um, with uh, more detail about the events that were occurring geologically than this one is. All of them are telling a basic story, which is that there are rocks on this planet that are really old, rocks on this planet that are less old, rocks on this planet that are not old at all. How do we know that? We don't have time to go into it. I'll pass the buck to Ralph on that one. Uh, uh, Ralph Sterley and Dave Young wrote a whole book about the Bible, Rocks and Time. You could read all about how rocks are dated. I actually think the point I'm going to make doesn't depend on how old you think these rocks are. The point is there's old ones, less old ones, youngish ones, young ones. Inside those rocks we find fossils. And fossils come in all sorts of different forms. Not just big scary dinosaur bones, sometimes little squishy things, sometimes tracks, all sorts of different ways that we can trace how animals lived in the past. But when we look at the pattern of how these fossils are represented in rocks of different ages or in, a, say, a, a set of a, a place in the, in, the, in the world where rocks of various ages are all together right on top of each other, we see the same thing every time. Namely, we see certain patterns, certain ordering to when organisms first appeared in the fossil record. Let me point out some things that, that are pretty extraordinary about this. Here's 3.5 billion years old when we think we have the oldest fossils of something that was alive. Then we have simple multicellular organisms at 700 million. You'll notice this is not a linear scale. Plants at 420, but look at this. 141 million years ago, first flowering plants. Now, there's some plant experts in our department, and I don't happen to be one of them, but I know the difference between a flowering plant and the other ones. The presence of flowers, for example. <laughs> <laughs> Guys, 141 million years ago, 420 million years ago. That means for something like 300 million years, there weren't any flowering plants. Now at this point I'm going to stop and do something I'm going to have to do repeatedly throughout this talk and, and this is unfortunate, I don't want to sound like I'm bashing creationism of every, any kind. In fact, at the end I'm going to be really straightforward about what I think you ought to do if you want to take a creationist standpoint. And simply say, it's really hard to account for this with flood debris being laid down. Like the pine tree settled out more than the ones with flowers? You see that the pattern of the fossil record contrasted with some other explanations. Common ancestry, development through time, really does a good job of explaining this. Mud settling after a worldwide flood, it doesn't work. I didn't say it didn't happen. I said it doesn't work. It gets worse. Fish. Let's see, where are the fish going to be? Well, they, yeah, they, it's not like they can, as the floodwaters rise, scamper up to higher ground, right? <laughs> Unlike sloths, apparently can. <laughs> if you didn't laugh at that, you've never seen a sloth. But anyway, <laughs> all right. So where are the fish? Well, let's see. Oh, they're not shown here. Let's just say there's one form of fish that comes around somewhere around here, and then others that are up here, the ones that are bony, the ones that aren't. And they're different by tens of millions of years. It's filtering the mud after a flood, it's not working. Where are the mammals? Dudes, they're way up here. To the point where a famous evolutionary biologist was once asked, and this was almost a century ago, I think, what would, what would, what, what would disprove evolution to you? And he said, simple, a rabbit in the Precambrian. So the Precambrian is down here. Show me a mammal down here, and the whole thing falls apart. I don't know if I agree with that, his sort of reasoning on falsibility, falsifiability. The point is, um, you don't see mammals till way up at the top. They first appear here, and then certain kinds of mammals like, say, apes, you know, a whole lot later. There's a couple other things in here like this famous mass extinction that wiped out the dinosaurs. The point is there's a pattern here, and it needs an explanation. It's really striking. There aren't any flowering plants in half the stinking fossil record. Because they float? All right. 
Something else about the fossil record that's interesting, and here I have to tell you a little story, and again, I hope, I hope I'm not bashing creationists, but it was popular 25 years or so ago to make fun of the idea of a transitional fossil. So what do I mean by a transitional fossil? Well, evolution, common to ancestry, proposes, for example, that whales, which you all know to be mammals, originally were things that walked on land. No, the whales themselves weren't, but their ancestors were mammals that walked around on the land. And you look at a whale skeleton, there's a lot of really interesting similarities to certain kinds of mammals that walk around on land. So the idea was, okay, this, this mammal walk around land, four feet, kind of big, someone said, ooh, you know, a cow. So some sort of cow-like thing eventually gave rise to whales. This idea was mocked by the opponents of evolution for a long time. Hilariously, actually, one of them will put up a picture, a slide up of Elsa the cow. Didn't she wear like a shower cap? and the big giant udders sticking out, and so there'd be Elsa the cow. And he's like, Elsa the cow, whale. Okay, so while Elsa the cow is waiting for flippers, what did she do? Tread water? <laughs> the idea, the idea that you could get from cow to whale was considered preposterous. In fact, this guy was really funny. I'd take a few pages out of his playbook. He would show his picture of Elsa the cow with udders trying to tread water with a tail or something like that and say, this is an utter failure. And then, of course, everyone laughed. <laughs> what? It's funny. <laughs> In fact, I'm not going to name the intelligent design advocate, but he's famous for um, accepting common ancestry. Fifteen or so years ago was also making fun of the idea that whales came from animals that walked around on the land. He doesn't talk like that anymore because we found some pretty interesting fossils. Some transitional fossils. You know, whales with legs. So here's a picture, and can you see what's interesting about these pictures? There is... These, these pictures both come from the work, by the way, of this guy, Phil Gingrich, at the University of Michigan. And you can see skeletons like this in the Paleontology Museum of the University of Michigan in Ann Arbor. And one of our former students in the biology department works in this lab. Oh, you can't really see the interesting thing about these pictures, can you? Oh, I set you up. <laughs> Let's see if I can... Ah, so much better. Hey, what is that? What is that? So these are called, I believe, archaeo, what's the word, help me out, Arch archaeocetaceans, archaeocetaceans, anyway, these are fossil whales, old whales. They're now extinct. They sure look like whales to me, but they have legs. It turns out there's a whole interesting series of intermediates, and by the way, it was easier to find them once someone figured out where they ought to look. Pakistan is a good place to look. Right now, not such a good place to look for other reasons. <laughs> Um, actually, that's true. So Phil Gingrich, Phil Gingrich was here giving a seminar just about a year ago, so really recently, and he said it's really a shame. They can't really dig in Pakistan anymore because of political problems and no other reason. But he also talked about a, a, a valley in Egypt. And they, they want it renamed, right? The Valley of the Whales, because it's a sandy valley where the, the, the soil is being eroded away, leaving whales, fossil whales, sitting there in the sand. Um, and you don't have to dig them up. You sort of take a picture, and I'm, I'm probably insulting the work of paleontologists now, but um, yeah, walking whales, once mocked, now hanging in paleontology museums. Oops! This is my favorite. I know it doesn't look like a whale to you. It might look like a whale to some people in the room who know what whale skeletons look like, and I'm not one of those. But this skeleton was of this first published in 1994. Four, I think, and this species was named Ambulocetus natans. Any Latin?